Heaven on earth. Uh, when, when we think about heaven on earth, we, we dream about a world of no crime, no violence, uh, kids shouldn't go to bed by themselves or are hungry, no war, a world of peace. That's what we think about when the term or the phrase heaven on earth comes to mind. But, but that's, that's not the world we live in. It's not the reality. We all know that, that, that bad things do happen. It happens to good people and it happens to bad people. Uh, children go to bed by themselves uh, all the time and, and, and war is happening all around us. So when Jesus prayed in Matthew as part of the Sermon on the Mount, he began with the prayer that he taught us how to pray. But in that prayer, it teaches us something, how to live like heaven on earth here and now. So the little prayer goes a little something like this. This is a little, a little review from the last couple of weeks. It says, uh, this is then how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptations, but deliver us from the evil one. Simple enough, easy enough for us to somewhat recite and understand. Jesus' approach to prayer is, it kind of draws out the intimacy between him and God. That, that his prayer wasn't about, God, give me this, give me this, protect me this, do this, do that for me. Uh, but his prayer is simply recognizing these simple truths, the, the, these five truths about the prayer. God is our Father. He is above creation, and he is holy. His desire for us is to live holy lives here and now. And then we remember that he is our provider, he forgives, and he is our protector. That pretty much sums up the Lord's prayer. And this is good to know. And it's good to know all the time, especially this time of the year, during the good times, during the bad times, during the times that we don't like or we're in celebratory. Uh, it's good to remember these five principles in the Lord's Prayer. One, He is our Father. He's above creation. His desire for us is to live holy lives. And He is the provider, forgives, and He is their protector. Now, easier said than done from the stage, obviously. I'm reading my notes, and I, I can tell you that. But how do we get there? How, how, how do Christians uh, going from just coming to church on Sundays or taking communion or, hey, I'll go whenever I can or I'll read my Bible whenever I can, just kind of passing by through life, pretending somewhat to be a Christian or hoping God loves me enough because I'm doing somewhat enough for him? I think God's desire for our lives is a little bit more than that. It is to be immersed, to be somewhat so intimately deep rooted with him like the Lord's Prayer. How do we get there? How, how do I get there as a Christian? Well, the secret is in the Beatitudes. Have you ever wondered why it's called the Beatitudes? Anyone want to take a stab at it? Okay, that's okay. The word beatitudes come from a Latin word. It's not on the screen. It's called uh, beatitudo, meaning blessedness or in the state of happiness or uh, this divine inward quality of joy that you are happy. People ask me all the time, how are you doing? How's the family doing? And to be completely honest with you, I'm happy. We're happy. My family is, we're really happy. Like we are. <laughs> Do we have stress in life? Absolutely. We have problems that's happened around us? Absolutely. We got a dog. All kinds of problems. All right? Dog hair everywhere. Not listening. Uh, goes in the backyard. And sometimes we forget to pick up after him and whatnot. But we, we're happy. We're really happy. It's not like we're, we're swimming in money or the Lord blesses us with a, a big house or a big car or unlimited resources. It's none of that. He, has, he blesses us with the house and the car and everything that we need, but we're happy. And, and the simple reason that we're happy is because we're in the Lord. 
We're remembering the Lord. We know who we are as people, as Christians. We know that God has us in his arms. So how do we get to this state of mind during this time of the year or as your Christian life in general? The secret is in the Beatitudes. So we'll read the whole Beatitudes for you. Let's stand up as we read that together. We haven't done this in a while as well. It says, uh, Matthew chapter 5, beginning verse 3, it says, Bless are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Bless are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Let's read it together. Bless are the, are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Next. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice. Be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets, who would be for you? Amen. Maybe seated. A little Bible test here, and I need your participation. And you heard it in the communion meditation already. When the nation of Israel left Egypt, God says, You are going to be my people. You are my prized possession. And He gave them what? Ten matters, right? His goal for his people was that if you remember these ten matters, we got that as the ten commandments. The Jewish people calls it the ten matters. He says, if you live by these ten matters, you are exemplifying my life in this foreign land that you're about to embark on. This new land, this blessed life. Now, there were ten matters. The first four matters don't have other gods. Don't create yourself a graven image. Don't use the Lord's name in vain. And then remember the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath. I need your participation here a little bit, okay? The fourth commandment, it says, remember the Sabbath. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, remember the Sabbath. Keep it holy. How many Beatitudes are there? Take a wild guess. Nine. Good try, though. <laughs> There are nine Beatitudes. One of the Beatitudes is missing. The fourth commandment says, remember the Sabbath. The fourth Beatitude says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. The rest of the Beatitude has to do with how we treat other people. The first four Beatitudes, it's how we remember God. It's almost a mirror image to the Ten Commandments. Ten matters, nine beatitude. Why only nine beatitude? Because the fourth beatitude was fulfilled by Jesus. The purpose of the fourth command is to keep them, to keep the nation of Israel, to focus on God. Remember your creator. Remember God. Remember I brought you out of Egypt. Remember the, the way you were living. Now live in this way. Remember me. So he created the Sabbath so people would know how to remember him. And it was God who did all the work to bring them out of Egypt, who made them right with him, but not by their own power, but by him. Uh, resting is not a virtue in the Beatitudes, but instead, the fourth Beatitude it says, Righteous, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled, because Jesus, it's our rest. Jesus fulfill the fourth commandment. And here Jesus, in Mark chapter 2, verse 27, he says, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. God created rest. A day of Sabbath for the people, so the people can reflect on who they are in God, remembering that they are renewed by God, they are saved by God, who delivers them out of the land of Egypt, and now Jesus, who fulfills the Sabbath, that's why Jesus says, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath, because now Jesus took that place of rest so that we can remember that we are a new creation in God. 
that we are saved by God, that it is through the blood and the body of Jesus Christ that it is his gift to us. There's nothing we can do that we are saved, that we have peace with God through his resurrection. Ephesians reflects these words as, as Paul writes it to the church there. He says, uh, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, for that no one can boast. We are made new. We are forgiven. We are in the right standing with God, and it's, and it's God's gift to us. That's why we celebrate Christmas. Do you notice that like, Christmas comes around and there's nothing you have to do except saying, Emmanuel, Jesus is here. God is here. You didn't do anything. It was God's gift to us. So back to Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. It says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That was my uh, Bible teaching to you. So Jesus' point here is it's beyond the Sabbath, but an invitation to eternal life of salvation, an invitation to be right with God. And I have one point for you today. That was Bible teaching. Now is the application. I have one point for you today, and we'll go home. A blessed life, it's a life going after God. Amen? A happy life, a blessed life, it's a life going after God. There, there is nothing in life that we should hunger and thirst for more than God. You, you often hear the older generation. <laughs> That's an inside joke from a Tuesday night Bible study. Right? If, you, if you miss out on Tuesday night Bible study, I hope you attend. There's like 20 of us, 22 of us, and we hang out and we eat and we talk about the Bible, and it's just a great community time. So, so you, you might often hear uh, uh, the older generation, they, they always say, you better get right what? You better get right with, you better get right with God before it's too late. And it's true. Don't you wish the young people would take that wisdom and advice? That they don't have to wait until they're whatever age that we consider old, I don't know. But don't you wish that they just listen and says, you better get right with God. Because there's nothing more fulfilling. Usually someone who lived a good life, a long life, doesn't have to be good, a long life, coming to an end of their lives. And the biggest advice to everybody is, is to get right with God. Why is that? Because there's nothing more fulfilling when you come to the end of your life knowing that you're in the right standing with God. Amen? Matter of fact, every day you walk around, as you get up, you live, and you breathe, and you move, there's nothing feels better. There, there's no single decision in life that's more important than the decision to follow Jesus to get right with God. And the rest of the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus explaining the Beatitude. So he, Jesus explained it this way in Matthew chapter 6, continue, verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, don't, don't worry about your life. Uh, the, 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 what you eat or what you drink, about your body, what you wear. It's, it's, it's not life more important than food and the body more than the clothes. Look at the birds of the air. So Jesus is pointing around the, the mountains that he's sitting on, and he sees things, and he says, look at the lilies, look at the mountains, uh, look at the birds of the air. Look how God takes care of them. Duh. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worrying at a single day or single hour to your life, and why do you worry about clothes? Uh, see how the flowers of the field grows? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You have little faith. Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, or run after them. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. 
But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble on his own. Your attention, please. God, Jesus is telling us, and we need to understand a little bit of what's happening. And food and the quality of fabrics, the quality of of clothes that they were wearing back then is very important. And how big of a party they're throwing and how many friends they got around them but that they can invite to these parties is very important. You can usually tell who's who's in society by what they wear, what they have, or how big of a party they throw. So all the people around them, if you weren't invited to these parties or you don't have enough nice of a fabric, usually you would feel a little bit insecure, unworthy, And worries begin to happen. How do I fit in? How do I get in with those people? How do I get in with that crowd? And Jesus bringing out a point in us is that our anxiety and our worries in life stems from struggling to compete with everyone else around us. Jesus is not saying you shouldn't eat delicious food. I do like delicious food, like a good steak, medium. Lunchtime. Good cookies. Jesus is not saying you you shouldn't have nice clothes. He's not saying that. I like comfortable, nice clothes, too, that I can afford within my price range. He's not saying that you should sit around and waiting for something to drop from heaven so you can have. Like, God provides for you, so you should sit around and here's a plate of food. That's not what he's talking about. That's laziness. The Bible talks about that, too. (laughs) If you're lazy, you don't eat. What Jesus talked about is that our our problem is that we are constantly trying to fill the God empty space in our lives. To to fill a place where God should be with self-deprecating thoughts of unworthiness compared to others. We allow, we even welcome. We even invite judgment of others, of those who have no idea who we are, what we're going through, or or what we have going on at home, to determine our value or our level of happiness. And and that's with all of us. I'm not exempt from that. Liz is certainly not exempt from that. There are days where my wife, Elizabeth Nugent, would say, how did she do that? <laughs> I got to remind Liz. I say, that's because you have four kids. <laughs> she doesn't have any. <laughs> but sometimes we invite these terrible thoughts and comparison from other people into our lives as if, like, they are going to determine our level of happiness. That can be stressful. We got to remind ourselves, that ain't nobody got time for that, right? Ain't nobody got time for that. So Jesus reminds these people that's sitting in front of him, watching him teach. And he says, don't worry. You're doing fine. Because the happiest life in your life is that you go after me, a hunger and thirst for righteousness. There is no single decision more important than the decision to follow Jesus. This is not my story, but, but I'm going to tell like it's mine. It was shared to me by a gentleman at Recovery Church service on Wednesday night. It's not my story. I'm going to share it as mine. Uh, I, I moved down here from, from Michigan back in July to go into rehab. My wife and two children are back home in Michigan. Limited phone calls. After a month of being in rehab here in Delray, I receive a divorce paper noticed. My wife wanted a divorce. That's simply because she can't trust who I am. She can't trust when I come back home. She can't trust if I'm going to be a good father or going to treat my ch- our children well. So she wanted a divorce. I plead and I beg and I said, I'm doing better. I'm going to do better. I'm going to come out of this. But no response. 
Thanksgiving comes around. I get a pass to go home. I'm now two months sober. I get a pass to go home and I, to get to see my children. I received a phone call from my wife. said, you can come home, but you can't stay at the house. You have to stay in a hotel, and we'll schedule a time for you to see your kids. It broke my heart. I drove up home to the windows, and, and even though I couldn't go see them yet, I haven't had a chance to check in the hotel, and I, I could see them jumping up the windows because I'm on the phone with them, and Daddy wants to see them. They want to see me, so I can see their head just popping all the windows, but I can't go see them because my wife says, no, you can't see them. Check into your hotel. So, so I went and checked into my hotel, and, and the next day I went to see my kids. It was a scheduled, supervised visit. I went in the house. It was just my wife and the children were happy, were excited. I hugged them. But I began to do things I'd never done before as a husband, as a man. I was calm. I was engaged. I had my children in my arms instead of a bottle. I start to clean the house. And, and I even do the dishes. Never heard of before. I went back to the hotel, and my in-laws came walking in the next day. Right behind her was my wife. Behind them was my wife. I said, why don't you check out of the hotel and come home and stay with us? Because she saw the life that has been changing in me through accepting Jesus Christ as my Lord and as my Savior. And I was baptized right here in the baptistry, here at this church from recovery service. So I stay home with my children, hung out with them for the entire week. And back to rehab. I'm hoping my wife will pull the divorce paper. I'm hoping that will happen, but we're going to need to pray. That story touches my heart, but also that story, one, it tells me that you guys are doing something right. Honestly, we put in a lot of resources and money to open this facility up on Wednesday for a group of people who might never get to experience Jesus, to hear the gospel for the first time, and their lives begin to change. Because there's no single decision in life that's more important than the decision to follow Jesus. This gentleman, he can fill his life with bottles, or we can fill our lives with the next drinks, or, or the next material things, or the next activities, or the next group of friends, whatever it may be. But all those things will always leave us empty. Broken families or the feelings of never good enough. Or we could be like Alex, like the story that I just told you, to let God into our hearts, to make changes. Not just saying, oh, I, I follow Jesus. No, no. If you follow Jesus or allow Jesus to change you, Start doing the things that Jesus is asking you to do. We can be hungry and thirst for God, wanting more of God than everything else in this world. We can submit to the scripture, allowing God to change us from the inside out. There was a song our kids sang two weeks ago, and it goes a little something like this. Because uh, on my best day, Come on, I'm a child of God. On my worst day, I'm a child of God. Oh, every day, it's a good day, and you're the reason why. I'm so blessed, I'm so blessed, got this heartbeat in my chest. No, it doesn't matter about the rest. If I got you, Lord, I am so blessed. I'm so blessed. Psalm 61 Psalm 63, verse 1, it says, Oh God, my soul, my, uh, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no waters. 
These are people who after God's own heart. And they said, my soul thirsts for you. Longs for you. The last of guy went camping with, with a bunch of guys. Had a great time. Had a great, I mean, like, great time. But regardless of the, not every scenario went as we planned. The rain, the mosquitoes, and of course, boys misbehaving and all that stuff. But we still had a great time. There was a moment where it wasn't so great. <laughs> Friday night, mosquitoes were everywhere. Everywhere. You walk out of your tent, you just, they just fill you up. There's nothing you can do about it. All kinds of bug sprays are flying everywhere. It's not helping. And on top of that, it started raining. And there's no worse feelings than while you're camping and it started raining. How many of you guys have ever been camping in the rain before? Yeah, terrible. Terrible. But here's the worst part. Early that evening, my, my son and I have... So it, it rained earlier. I was going to stay in Joe Sharp's tent, but his tent was filled with water. So I said, well, I'm not going to stay in there. I haven't set up my tent yet. I had a little smaller tent for just my son and I. So I said, I'm going to set up my smaller tent so I can sleep in the dry tent. Here's the kicker. The whole time I'm laughing at Joe... Because I have a dry tent because I haven't set it up yet. I'm laughing at him uh, because he had a wet tent. As I was setting up my tent, I pushed the rod too hard and it snapped. It was old. So it snapped. So now uh, I have a tent but didn't have a covering on top because the rod snapped. I'm laughing at Joe because my tent is dry. The rod snapped. This is God's way of saying, <laughs> don't, worry, don't, don't, don't mess with Joe. <laughs> God's saying, no, don't mess with Joe. <clears throat> That night, it rained again. This time, even though Joe's tent is still wet, dripping a little bit, mine was worse because at least he has a covering on top. I don't have a covering on top. So water was coming in. Stop. No, I'm just kidding. Water was coming in, so here is me, right? Uh, Avery and Aaron was sleeping in the tent with Justin and then Aram had a stomach ache because he ate too much junk food earlier, which I warned him, don't eat a lot of junk food. So now he's in my tent with Ari as well, this little tiny thing, because his stomach hurt. It's raining. It's windy. I hear Antonio in the next tent to us, Papa Joe, I want to go home. <laughs> Joe whisper, it's four in the morning, three in the morning. We can't go home right now. <laughs> Just hang in there. <laughs> This too shall pass. I have Ari sleeping. I have Aram in my tent. Stomach hurt. Ari sleeping. Aram stomach hurt. Antonio, I want to go home. Joe, hang in there. Rain pouring down. Getting into our tent. Ari sleeping. I don't know how he's sleeping. He's sleeping. Water start to creep in. We scoot all to one little spot of the tent. I'm trying to calm Aram down because his stomach was hurting. Ari was still sleeping. He's starting to get a little uncomfortable because he's feel the wetness. Antonio, Papa Joe, want to go home. Joe, hang in there. It's 2 o'clock in the morning, 2.30. Rain's pouring in. Aram went back to Justin's tent because our tent now began to fill with water. Sleeping bags are wet. I began to notice Aram was getting uncomfortable. He's now laying in water in this little tiny tent. I didn't know what to do. I picked up Ari. I'm squatting like this because water's all around us. I home like this. 2.30 in the morning. You can sleep, son. Water's filling in. Rain is pouring down. The wind is blowing. I can hear it. I can feel it. And as comfortable, uncomfortable as it may be, I'm holding R in my arms. So you can sleep, son. Not once that Ari woke up. He had no idea that his father was holding him. And it always rang in our life, doesn't it? It seems like things are going well. You're having a great time. And the storm comes. And it rang. And it rang on your parade. And those moments where you feel like, where is God? And Jesus reminds us, blessed are you who are hunger and thirst for righteousness. For you will be filled. 
when the world around us seems to be crumbling and the winds are blowing. I have nothing left. I'm tired. I'm weary. Know that you made the most single important decision in life is to follow Jesus. That he is holding you. As uncomfortable it may seem sometimes, he's holding you. And he says, rest. I got you. Because a blessed life, it's a life going after God. A blessed life, it's a life going after God. People ask me all the time, how are you guys doing? As a band come forward. How are you guys doing? I said, we're happy. Because we know whether my car was in the shop this week, whatever life circumstances may be, I know God is holding us. Even though I only see the storms, I only see the wind, I only see the waters creeping, and I only see the, I hear the noise, I, I see the news, I, I hear your story, and I see those things, and I hear those things, and I feel those things. But I know deep in my heart I have made the single most decision in life is the decision to follow Jesus. I'm after God. I'm thirst for him. And he's holding us in his arms. And he simply said to us during this time of the year, just rest. Just rest.